I am a relatively new member in terms of the, the other folks uh, in this uh, in this uh, club. I'm originally from the D.C. area. I was in, uh, in the private practice of law, as well as holding uh, some positions uh, in the uh, federal government. And it's interesting in connection with our speaker today, coincidentally, I was general counsel of USAID, United States Agency for International Development, uh, which uh, and so my responsibilities were included um, managing attorneys in Kiev, in Tbilisi, Georgia, and yes, in uh, Moscow. So I spent, I made a number of trips uh, to Ukraine. Uh, in addition, uh, my daughter served in the Peace Corps and spent two and a half years as an English teacher uh, in Ukraine in the small town of Jovka, which was uh, outside of Lviv. So that's uh, very fortunate for me, at least, to be able to uh, uh, have as our speaker uh, from, from Ukraine. I'm going to depart slightly from uh, what you might normally do, or what we normally do is I'm going to ask for a blessing on Ukraine. So we pray for the people of Ukraine, for all those suffering or afraid, that you, God, will be close to them and protect them. We pray for world leaders for compassion, strength, and wisdom to guide their choices. In this moment of crisis, may we reach out to our brothers and sisters in need. May we see peace and justice become a reality for the people of Ukraine. So may it be. So, in the event, next thing we've got is the um, welcoming our guests and visiting Rotarians. First of all, are there any visiting Rotarians uh, here today? Second is, do we have any guests? And if we do, if uh, your host uh, could stand and have the guest uh, rise as well, if able, we would appreciate it. Uh, my guest is Michael Rosenbacher, a Chapel Hill graduate and a UNC graduate and is involved in uh, uh, restaurants here at Chapel Hill. Welcome. My guest is my wife, Becky. Uh, and we'll hear a little more about the uh, play today. My guest is uh, Lily Engelhardt, who is with Hunter Jones, and her husband, Tom Engelhardt, who has spent a lot of time And uh, Jeff Bloomfield is with me. He was recently voted in as a member, but technically not a member because we have to induct him. And then I have some gentlemen from Ryla who I will introduce later in the program. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going to pass up, start passing along the fine basket. So let me do this, is uh, just tell you a little story, which is about uh, what I've done in the past, as well as uh, a bit of local history uh, in the uh, Baltimore, Maryland area. I was uh, a law clerk to the chief judge of the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland in Baltimore. Uh, and uh, one day I was asked by my boss, the chief judge, uh, to come to his chambers. Uh, he asked me to get a birthday gift for our courtroom clerk. I'll refer to him as Earl G. And Earl G uh, was, um, had his birthday coming, coming up. And the judge said, I want you to go down to the block. Now, those of you who are familiar with Baltimore know the block. And specifically, I was to go to the 2 o'clock club. At the two o'clock club, I was to uh, get a memoir of Blaze Star. Um, Blaze Star, for those of you who are not familiar with her, you might describe her as an exotic dancer, um, or you could also describe her as a stripper. Uh, but I was to go down and get the book, so I toddled uh, down there. 
And uh, there she was, and I plucked down my money. I need to tell you a little bit about Blaze Star. Uh, she was carrying on a open affair with then Governor Earl Long. Earl Long was the brother of Senator Huey Long, the kingfish. Now, Earl Long um, uh, was an eccentric, to say the least. Among uh, things that he proposed was that there be a dual highway system to, to address the issue of drunk drivers. So the drunk drivers would have one uh, road system, and those who did, were not drinking had a separate uh, road system. I say this was an open affair because uh, Governor Wong was married to a woman affectionately known throughout the state as Miss Blanche. So um, I was to go down there and get him to autograph, or she to, get, to autograph this book. Oh, by the way, there was apparently a Life magazine <laughs> picture of Clay Star arm in arm with Governor Wong. So that's how open uh, this was. So uh, I went down there, stood in line, got the book. And she said, uh, and your name is? And I said, uh, for a moment I paused because I was thinking, gee, I'm dating a woman who would ultimately become my wife of 42 years. Now she had a sense of humor, but that all extended so far. And I <laughs> put that idea behind me and it said, no, the book is for Earl G. So she looks at me, smiles, and with a twinkle in her eye, inscribes the book. She gives the book to me, I take the book, I hustle out. Now, I don't know why I was hustling out. It's not as if somebody would know who I was. But anyway, I hustled out and headed back to the courthouse. So I stopped at the corner, opened up the book flap, and the inscription read, to the other Earl of my life, love legs. <laughs> so I took the book back to the judge. The judge uh, had it wrapped. Earl G came in. We had a small ceremony for his birthday. He opened it up, looked at it, um, he turned red-faced and uh, mumbled something, and then ultimately left uh, the chambers. Now, I can assure you one thing. That book never made it to his home. Mrs. G never saw it. In fact, that book never left the courthouse. Now, that's a little bit of uh, history that you're not going to get from a uh, friend. <laughs> I mentioned this to him, and he had actually promised to be here. Uh, I don't see him, but this could be a Jeopardy question uh, down the road for those of you who uh, watch, uh, watch Jeopardy. So that's a little bit uh, of, of a story. I want to turn it over to uh, folks who are going to introduce our speaker, and I'm going to say to our speaker, Dobra Ben. Thank you, Alan, that was wonderful. Alan has lived a very uh, interesting life for those of you who have not had a chance to speak with him. I uh, recommend you do when you get a chance. There's a lot he cannot talk about in public. Um, we have uh, a wonderful speaker today. Before we, before we get to our speaker, I'd like to have Lorenzo come up. He has a presentation uh, with some youth members who have attended Rila. Also, before I forget, board members, we are going to meet. Now, you can come on up, Doug. Yeah. Uh, board members, we're going to meet very quickly right after this meeting uh, for a vote. Okay. Please help me with that. Thank you. Guys, come on up, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have some new members, so if you don't know me, my name is Lorenzo Mejia, and I run Youth Services. And one of the signature programs we do is called RILA. Um, does anyone here have someone in high school who's a freshman or a sophomore. All right, well, uh, Ryla is for high school juniors, so keep that in mind as you listen to these guys. I'd like to introduce Lewis Lassiter, who attends East Chapel Hill, Krish Gandhi, who attends Chapel Hill High, and Stephen Chen, who attends East Chapel Hill High. They all went to uh, Ryla with us this past spring, and I'm, I'm just going to just kind of kind of be around Robin. We'll pass the mic a little, ask them a few questions about their experience. 
But Lewis, let me start with you and just say, explain what Rhino was for you and for people who may not know what it is. Uh, it was a short overnight event. We learned about leadership things. Um, yeah, we learned, we took a Meyer Briggs personality test. We learned about like flaws and strengths of each of our personality types. Uh, we did some team building activities with our groups and we ate food. <laughs> uh, Rylan, we mainly learned about leadership, but also how to communicate with others. <coughs> Just how to really run a team and work for really one common goal. Um, for me, um, Rylan is actually a unique experience where I got to explore a little bit more about myself, but uh, also more importantly, um, it was an experience to communicate with others and work with others. You guys don't have, I don't need a mic. Um, you guys don't need to always answer the same question, but you're welcome to, I, you know, I don't want the number three person to get on the spot because the number one person took the good answer. Uh, but uh, uh, Stephen, let me ask you, um, what would advice would you give to someone who's gonna go to Ryland next year? Um, I guess, Bring bed sheets because that's one time ago. <laughs> Good advice. Bring bed sheets. Um, I think it would be, uh, I guess, expect um, an experience where it's not uh, just yourself being, um, I guess, being with by, by yourself. It's more like, uh, I guess, communicating with others. And you expect a lot of teamwork. And you guys um, if you're gonna go, just do everything. There's like a lot to do. If you're gonna go to bed, don't go to bed. Go do something outside. There's other stuff to do. And talk to everybody because you only go once. You want to? Yeah, that's pretty good. And then um, just one final question. So all you guys are rising seniors. And you're all thinking about college. Tell us what you're thinking. What, you know where you'd like to go to school. What you hope to study. What your plans are um, in this next year and beyond. Uh, I'm gonna apply to Purdue likely and try and get a mechanical engineer at Purdue. Uh, if that doesn't work out, we'll go to NC State or something. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to NC State graduates. Uh, okay. um, I'm definitely applying. I don't really know where, but UNC is definitely on the list. And yeah, we'll see. Uh, probably entrepreneurship is where I'll be starting. Uh, I want to study about uh, computer science. And um, I guess my dream school will be to go to UNC because I wanted to stay local and do this. Okay, so do. Guys, thank you. How about just a round of applause for this great gentleman? I just would like to give a shout out to Chris Selmore. He's not here today. He's got some family graduation activities. Chris ran the whole Ryla program, and I'm sorry he couldn't be here to, uh, you know, welcome the boys. And I also wanted to thank Mary Rutkowski. She didn't come today either. Mary has continuously done transportation. Right. This takes place north of Durham at Camp uh, something or other, like an hour and a half north, and she's always provided transportation, which we greatly appreciate. So thank you guys. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thanks for all you do with our youth. Um, I wanted to see if uh, any members have any announcements, uh, any board members have any announcements they'd like to make. I know Bill White just celebrated a special birthday. I don't think he's here today, but do we, if you are a uh, June birthday, if you have a June birthday, please stand up. All right, all right. Okay, all the flowers have a birthday, June birthday. Okay, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it off to Bob Woodruff. Thank you. <clears throat> As most of you, uh, many, so many of you know, uh, Becky and I own the uh, Raymond Print Shop. She runs it. Uh, downside of credit card uses these days is when I go by to take money out of the uh, till, there's not much in there. <laughs> uh, 
But uh, to give back to local artists, uh, Becky uh, started what she calls an artist frame up, where she recycles frames. Uh, people donate frames, their old frames to, to the frame print shop. They cut them or do whatever they need to do and then donate them to local artists. Uh, they come by and they pick up the frames, the dryas, mats, etc. cetera. Uh, and she also, if she, they do buy something, she gives them a significant discount uh, for that uh, type thing. But uh, she came home one day and uh, told me that she met a real neat guy, uh, a guy named Anatoly, a, re a Ukrainian refugee who uh, came here in, in 2022 with his wife and three sons. Uh, uh, he stopped by, he had heard about the Hardest Frame Hub, and came by and, uh, and Becky started talking with him, learned his life story, uh, went to his house, looked at uh, uh, his art that he had smuggled out of Ukraine. Uh, I say smuggled because uh, nobody ever checked his bags, uh, so we don't really know whether they would have confiscated them or not. But uh, then anyway, he brought uh, a lot of his paintings here. He's since uh, uh, gotten studio space up at uh, Eno uh, Art Studios and, uh, and does uh, a lot, doing a lot of new paintings there, has a website, etc. But uh, we've all followed the Ukrainian uh, saga of Russia invasion, etc. So. I asked Anatoly to come tell us about uh, a little bit, a little bit about his life, about uh, kind of what Ukraine was like before the invasion, what kind of things he heard, uh, they were hearing about Russian invasion, kind of what was what it was like afterwards, uh, and then uh, uh, kind of a little bit about the kind of the opinion that the Ukrainians have of the United States, both before and after the war. So, without further ado, uh, Anatoly Terezia. Hello everybody, I'm just so thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me here. All right, uh, so uh, I thought you were gonna ask me a question or just I have no. to go for all this list. Yeah. Oh, right, I don't have a list. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I thought you said we're gonna have an interview. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. um, personal background. So I was born in central part of Ukraine which is what we call a steel heart. Uh, a lot of industrial steel production happening there. And because of that, there are so much pollution, right? And uh, it's, I mean, it's not the best place to be born in the world, but yeah, it was not my decision, okay? <laughs> anyway, so I was born there in 1978 and uh, spent at least good 40 years there and um, um, you know when the 90s came but so when the Soviet Union fell apart uh, Ukraine kind of are you know became so so poor everybody became so poor only few people who were having money or probably those who were connected to communist party somehow that you know that they were beneficial, you know, they, they were stealing some stuff, some cheap, you know, industry areas, they were buying for, for, for scrap. But my family uh, was poor, and somehow I ended up to be in a uh, children's theater as a child, as an actor. That became, became my life occupation. So um, I grew up there, I started to work there as an actor money. Even before I finished my, my school, I all, already was working there as an actor. Um, so in uh, 1998, I uh, ended up going to Bible college, and uh, it was an interesting experience. And it was three years experience. And somehow along the way, when I was uh, study there, uh, I started to realize like I can understand English speakers, English teachers, before they be translated. You know what I mean? It's like we have so many uh, Americans coming from Minneapolis area, from Canada. I studied English before, right? But it was not, I didn't know why America needed, right? I was like, okay, we're studying some strange language. I don't know why I need it. So um, 
somehow when we wait a year, up, a year, up, a year and a half, I kind of uh, became aware of my knowledge of English. So I, in church, I started to translate from the stage uh, to pastors who were coming to preach there. That was a beautiful experience. So in 2005, I uh, became a self-employed and uh, started a um, sound production company, uh, sound recording facility in the central part of Ukraine. Uh, also, I was doing video production, and I was painting too, right? Um, it wasn't big stuff, but it was pretty good money, right? In 2019, uh, we decided to move to Kiev. Um, and uh, that was kind of a tricky decision because as soon as we moved in December 2019, in a couple of months, COVID hit it. So it was, uh, I could not uh, earn money by making art, selling art. So I ended up uh, working as a tax taxi driver, never thought I'd be there, right? But what can you do? That was only one available option since I had a good card at, at the time. Um, and little by little, um, we were kind of a, a little bit light in Kiev, I would say. And uh, because Ukraine, after President Zelensky was elected, Ukraine was a different country. Maybe we have to realize one thing. When the Soviet Union fell apart and uh, all these countries became independent. For Ukraine, that was not clearly 100% being independent. Because all the time in parliament, there was a group paid by Russians for long, for more than, for more than 20 years, like almost 30 years now, who was constantly arguing with the patriots of Ukraine. And uh, not many really people understood what was really happening there until the very last year before war started. Uh, when 2014 happened, right? You can you could see, okay, these people really kind of were flying to Moscow all the time, you know? Why are they flying to Moscow all the time? No one else doing that, doing that from power, but this group of flying to Moscow, right? That was weird. And, um, when the war started, um, we were in Kiev. It was quite a dramatic experience because I was uh, getting phone calls from the United States, from my friend. We uh, we artists in one uh, artist union here online uh, in North Carolina, and uh, she was saying like, hey, are you all right there? Because I'm hearing terrible things like Russians are about to attack, they about to move in into Kiev, attack Kiev. And I was, honestly, I was telling her something like, hey, listen, come down, everything is gonna be all right because they will never ever attack Kiev because that's a modern European city, like six million people live there. Like, that's not gonna happen. That was a shock when it actually happened, right? And it was, uh, I remember that time clear as a day. Uh, it was 6 a.m. when we got a phone call from my mother-in-law. And she was the kind of a person uh, who really suffered from communistic party. She, uh, they used to be very wealthy in Odessa area, where is the Black Sea is. Uh, they used to have a farm and everything was taken away from them in 1917 uh, when the revolution happened, right? And uh, she had lost her siblings because of uh, you know, them being sent to Siberia. So she was always quite negative to Russia, right? And she said, even before 2014 happened, you'll see, they're gonna take her in. In Donetsk region, they're gonna talk. We were like, come on, come in. And then it happened, and she said, oh, I told you. <laughs> so she said, they're going to attack Ukraine. We were like, whoa, no, that's not going to happen. And uh, when uh, all this uh, training you know, with the Belarusian troops started in the summer 2021, she was telling us constantly, like, okay, you have to live here. Come to my place, which is central part of Ukraine, quite safe here. 
great. And uh, you will keep saying her like, oh, okay, no. We kind of like it in here. People don't want to go there because it's like, oh, boys around. Not, you know. So uh, she called me when the war started and she said, I told you. <laughs> and now it's too late because all roads were blocked with the people trying to escape. So stay there now until you know, see it's free to go. That was challenging. We, we used to rent our apartment on eighth floor and I could see the highway. When the war started, I went like look outside and the highway when it was packed with the cars and it was traffic, it was not moving anywhere. And you can just imagine this sound of a sirens. It's not one siren, it's a sirens, it sounds of many sirens. So it's like uh, kind of a noise of the sirens coming. And uh, I, could, I was able to hear some explosions on the background. What's going on here? And all, all of that was so surreal. And we decided uh, to wait, not to go anywhere because it was pointless. All highways were blocked. We did some prepacking, you know, just in case, but we were not ready to leave that apartment. And as a matter of fact, I had my studio in that apartment. So it was like a little museum there. I had more than 45 pieces of art there and different sizes. Uh, the biggest was 40 by 60. So it was no chance for me to take it. So I thought, well, I should take kind of a small size, the best, were like my favorite pieces, and just hope for the best. So I put it, put it aside. And uh, we were outside playing with the, with the the boys at the time we had two boys like probably eight and uh, six we went to big grocery stores and you know how you've seen the movies like you were expect i was expecting empty shelves mm -hmm. right and nothing like it was there and it's like okay but maybe it's going to be over in the end of the day you know it was always so naive right it was only starting and uh, we were not told how serious that was they didn't want to scare us because that would be a disaster in the war. So um, I was posting on, on the Facebook, my, you know, my family, we are in safety, you know? And I started to get these messages like, oh, are you sure in safety? You know, here there's some shooting in your area, street shooting. And I was like, what? No, be fine. And then I got a phone call from my friend. He said, hey, you've been posting these uh, messages and um, you have to know like uh, 20 kilometers from you, Russian troops trying to land and um, land in the airport. Uh, when he named the location, I was shocked because I knew the place. And I knew it's 20 minutes drive from me. It's like, wow, that's really serious. And uh, I said, honey, we have to leave now. And uh, I know she's the, the one who's doing all packing, right? I'm just a driver. I can put it in the car, you know, that's way. But, but she was pregnant at the time. It was eight months of pregnancy for the third baby. So it, it took quite time for us to pack. And finally, when we were ready, it was 9 p.m. I, I made a phone call to a friend of mine, asked her, he lived just probably an hour drive from here to the safer area. He said, oh, just come, you know, we have a space for you. We went there and uh, spent there one week trying to leave country uh, on the Moldovian border, uh, it didn't work because there was a law on the second day after war started, they came up with a law, no man allowed to leave country except if they're older than 60 or they handicapped or they having three children younger than 18. So by the time we had only two and a half children, <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. To me, that was three, right? But not for custom <laughs> workers, right? They wanted to see birth certificate. But it was so weird because I knew people who made it through that checking point before we came there with the same condition, like the two ch having two children and being pregnant. They were rented the way out, but they reject us. So we decided to stay in the uh, western part of Ukraine. And that was a beautiful place. Uh, the name of it is uh, Knelnitsky, and it's probably five hours to, to the Polish border. And uh, my third son was born there. And uh, that was, uh, you know, complicated because 
when the, the Russian were shooting these missiles, actually we couple of times I could hear flying missile above our roof. Can you imagine it? Because there is a, a, a fight jet that's a, kind of a louder and a fast speed, but all these missiles, they're kind of a slow. And I was like, okay, it's kind of a ghost somewhere, okay? It's better not to go down here. Um, so my concern was, if baby will start, you know, baby will do, no sirens because they're gonna ask everybody to go to the basement. And it's not a shelter, it's really a dirty basement, it's dirty place. It's not good for a woman to go there, for a baby, newborn to go there. So on a day when the David was born, no sirens. Next day, three sirens. So they had to go you know, with a the newborn there. Um, yeah, so. So after baby was born, we were free to leave country, right? Do you know uh, how it got to the United States? Do you know? No. Do you want to know? Yeah. All right, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was all legal. It was all legal. <laughs> not, not from Mexico border. <laughs> so um, we had a few options on our plate. We got an invitation from England. A friend of mine you know, kindly invited us to go to England. We knew some family who made it to Canada and they loved it. We also knew some people who made it to the States and they hated it, <laughs> right? And why they hated it? Because when they came, they realized like they had to bring this big sack of money, which they didn't have at the time. Like, I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars because at the time, United for Ukraine program didn't have any benefits included. Even if you apply for the work permit, it might take up to nine months to get you the one. So everybody was like, shot, what we should do? They were working you know, illegally for a lower you know, pay, but they were really shot. And they, when they were hearing, okay, some Canadian family, I know family who made it to Canada and they were given a $15,000 in the day. No, 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 just have fun, buy a car, right? And they loved it. <clears throat> so, but we felt like we have to come here, right? We have to come here, and uh, we found some sponsor who put their signature on papers, not to have any obligations. Also, uh, we found a term uh, that uh, temporary housing that was a catch the fire church rally. They were give, they give us uh, uh, opportunity to stay in their guest house. <coughs> yeah, so we came in July last year. That was quite a trip. Uh, having all this art back in you know, Rome, in Tubes, right, uh, above mentioning it, no, nothing was checked, was my biggest concern, because it was so tightly rolled in the walls, so I thought, if, if, if they're gonna ask me to open it, I'm gonna need a big, clean space, and a lot of time, and luck, because it's, it was so tightly rolled. So nothing was checked, that was another miracle. So, um, what was Ukraine like before invasion? When Zelensky was elected, it was end of era of cor terrible corruption. I'm not saying it, there's no corruption anymore. But all those presidents who were before him were terribly corrupt. Like previous uh, Poroshenko, we call him a chocolate king because he owned so many chocolate factories. Like this. Even in Russia, you know, and when he, he became a, a president, actually before he became, he was promising, that if you elect me, I will sell my Russian factory because uh, you know, Russia's already took some land. Donetsk region, uh, Crimea. When he was elected, he kind of forgot about it, right? And he was keep getting money from that place. And actually he was trading a coal from, from Russia. That's a terrible story. But anyway, when Zelensky was, um, Appointed as a president, actually I know him. Um, I, I cannot say I know him. I met him once, and he. Uh, by the time he was already a successful businessman, they ran into a really nice comedy show. Uh, they were having a uh, film production comedy. You know, really successful. So he didn't need really much money then. And uh, when I met him before he became a president, he was really nice and. 
just talking to you. There's no work, we're not any workers, right? So when Zelensky uh, started, he decided to fix all the roads, which was a problem for years, for more than 30, maybe 40 years. I was amazed because they're fixed. There was a road called, uh, what we call Curse Road. There was road from uh, Krivo Road, which is the center part, to Odessa direction. I'm not, I'm not joking. Uh, I drove that uh, road uh, like once. So it used to take two hours to drive, but uh, since it was broken, it was taking six hours to drive. Okay, so hose, this is my word. Hose was that big, like if you will drive a car, a sedan car, you will disappear <laughs> in the crater. That was so bad because they were keep stealing money for fixing that road. But he finally fixed it. I mean, he's my hero, right? And he was keep doing it everywhere, everywhere in Ukraine, fixing these roads. So he's my hero in that because I was enjoying it. Because I, after that, it felt like we're in Germany. Perfect roads. Yeah, no roads because of course, Germany has the best roads ever. Um, <clears throat> so, um, because of Russians having their agents in the government all the time, um, not many really realize how bad that thing was. But somehow, there was a bad joke to that agents. Because they thought Ukrainians will be really warm, wel giving welcome, warm welcome to Russians when they will come, right? So Russians were kind of expecting warm welcome because I don't know they've been told like uh, Ukrainians so tired of this corrupt president, they they need you here, right? Because in my opinion, Russia is most one of the most corrupted countries in the world. Because I know people who live there in villages, and uh, I mean, in this time, like they're so rich, they have all, all this oil, uh, diamonds, gold, and uh, natural gas. It's billions of dollars, but a regular person is not getting any, any of it. Any, any, even not a, even a dollar. They live in the villages without central water, having a um, toilet outside, right? You know, in a wooden thing. In winter time, what is it? There's no natural gas sometimes, and uh, that's why when there all the soldiers came to Kiev area to uh, attack, they were shocked with the level of light. Because what the Russian government did, what, what the Putin did, they kind of brought people from a very poor regions as a soldiers. You know, you have to be a soldier. You have to protect your land, right? And somehow that land ended up in Ukraine, right? But well, it has to be in Russia, right? When, when they came, the first time, I'm not joking, first time of them saw a, a you know, this toilet, toilet, the white thing, they were like, what is it? <laughs> How, uh, we don't have any holes outside. I was like, <laughs> and I was shocked, like, there was kind of an evil mind to bring all this uh, Russian nation to such a poverty, not in, only in their pockets, in their minds, you know? Okay, uh, do you have any questions? <laughs> How much time do we have? I don't know. We've got to do the Yeah. Yes. So, um, you talked a little bit about President Zelensky. Yes. Um, and I know he was, he was a comedian, he yep. had his own TV show. Yep. Um, how long is he supposed to continue to be president? Will there be elections mm -hmm. uh, during this crisis? And what's the plan then? Well, according to our laws, he's gonna stay there until the war is over, right? Because this is, you know, this, there's war. There's no, I, I was actually so encouraged with his de decision not to leave. I mean, I don't know how many times he was attacked. You know, they tried to kill him, all these troops tried to kill him, but he stayed in Kiev. He got nuts, I'm sorry for saying it, but, but this is amazing person. Like, none of those presidents before they would do it. I, I'm pretty sure they would do it. 
escape or make some kind of a train, okay, okay, take whatever you want, just leave me alone in my place. But I'm pretty sure um, he actually was elected with 73% of the voters, which is crazy. Yeah, with the with the other guy being in office, he he was using administrative resources to kind of uh, do whatever, but this his opponent got seventy three percent. That's amazing support. I think now he got ninety eight something. I know it sounds like propaganda, but everybody likes him. Everybody just support whatever he's doing. But is that he did answer? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, concerning the war and. Um, do you want to return to the Ukraine or would you rather stay in the U.S.? Uh, you want to go somewhere else to live? In Brazil? Well, I would really like to hear, okay? Um, because I think after the war is over, we never know, first thing, we never know when. What, what I know for sure, my art will be the very last thing that people will be willing to, willing to buy because they lost houses. You know, the level of poverty is really high now, okay? So I really want to stay in the United States of America. And I started to do a little bit little bit of business, you know, having this art of mine, uh, started the print service, something like that. I'd like to know something about your art. Yes. <clears throat> do you, do you have, can you show it to us or is that in the morning? Well, you, what, yeah, that's simple. What you have to do, you have to go to Instagram and using my last name, Star Soup, that's me, that's it. Star Soup dot art. That's gonna take you to my but Can Instagram. you tell us about your art? What, yes, that's what? all abstract stuff, um, abstract art. And I started to do it in 1996. I was doing it for quite, you know, probably five, six years, and then all this Bible college thing, and then I got back to this art seriously in 2018. Since then, I was really kind of doing it. I was doing some sales in Ukraine, but uh, I would say probably the best sales what I made so far was was made in the United States. Yeah, what we have, we just had here a beautiful exhibition, right, at the Baker's Friends and Green Shop. We're gonna have it more in August, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. In August, okay. yeah, it's gonna be available too. Uh, you know, yeah. So I do abstract art. It's interior art. I really like uh, kind of a flow with the flow. You know, it's like just get in a specific colors and see where it, where it takes me. That's all. Yes, please. My understanding is that um, before 2014. Um, there was a lot of Russian spoken in Ukraine. Um, did you notice mm -hmm. a difference after 2014? Yeah, sure, of course. Well, the Russians, uh, I've mentioned they, they were having people in parliament who were really kind of pro Russian. They were really not pro Russian, they were Russian agents. That's all. It was their <laughs> job, right, to be kind of a pretend to be pro Russian. So, they were kind of um, using this uh, language issue, which never were there. You know, we can speak Russian. I was raised in a family speaking Russian. Right. Nobody ever, you know, attacked me for not speaking Ukrainian, and I learned Ukrainian in school, right? So uh, I can speak two languages, Ukrainian and Russian, right? Yeah. So after 2014, people started kind of uh, switching to Ukrainian because it felt like speaking Russian kind of a draw Russian to your territory. You know, it's kind of a portal. If you speak Russian, they will come to protect you. <laughs> I mean, that was so weird. This wow. propaganda was keep invading this question, I mean, this problem with the, the language. Right? Even now, if you, well, I don't, I'm not sure now, <laughs> if you will speak Russian, they will think you kind of were a spy or somebody, right? Everybody just understand it. Like it's not easy if you were you're talking all your life Russian, and then it's not easy to switch to Ukrainian because there there are some similarities, but uh, similarities in such a funky way you can get you can get you in trouble. Like you you if you're Russian, then you kind of think oh it's kind of uh, all the same. 
you everybody will laugh at you because sometimes Russian words means different in Ukraine. Yes. Some of your artwork up there. Oh, may I ask one you. question, uh, actually, yes. before you go into that? Can you give us an idea of the extent of the problem with this flood? Uh, okay. It's hard to tell, but it okay. sounds like it's absolutely horrendous for oh, yeah. everyone. Oh. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know. There's something special about it. Every uh, since it happened, I, I keep crying about it because uh, since 1988, probably. Each summer we used to go to Black Sea. So there was a, this dam was on the way there. So we were traveling there. And uh, to see it being destroyed, it's just a, it's such a tragedy. We really don't know how many people died because of that. And, and actually there was a, you know, of course Russians saying, oh, it was not our war, it was Ukrainian thing. But you have to realize how devastating it is for Ukrainian economical uh, income, because we still control some of the land with a, a lot of uh, uh, agriculture production. So they don't have no water to water it. And uh, some of the fields were flooded. And now it's not gonna be so good soil, you know what I mean? It's not good soil anymore. And, um, they're not getting any water in Crimea now, which is weird. But I think what they did, they were, they were really scared of uh, Ukrainians taking over the dam. And now it's quite complicated for Ukrainians to get on the other side because it's not water, a lot of swamps. Um, and they actually uh, put a lot of bombs there when they just got it a year ago. When they're a few days after they attacked, they was they go. They made a small hole there so water will go to Crimea. That was a small hole. But uh, yeah, of course I was not there, I was not an engineer there. But I, what I heard, and that can be true, it was built actually in 1950 something. And at the time they were really afraid of uh, atomic bomb or anything. So it was so nice built, like really solid. So it could handle rocket attack, even atomic bomb attack. So that kind of destruction, what we see now, it's nothing just from inside. They put a lot of explosive inside and all energy just, oh. Well, did it answer your question? I know that's terrible because I see people who, who lost their houses, like this is, more than we can understand. After a house being floated to the second floor, I mean, that house is done, right? I mean, they lost all their belongings. You know, thousands of houses being destroyed that way. I mean, maybe a hundred thousand of houses, we don't know. And these people, they don't know where to go. Like, when the war started, it was a big way for people, refugees going to Poland and other countries, right? And after, probably six months, people started to come back because it's always tricky to live in different country, especially in a different culture, right? In Poland, that was a problem for Polish people because they suddenly have lost their jobs, a lot of jobs because of Ukrainians, because Ukrainians were willing to work for less money, right? They were like, okay, we're gonna stop it now. So they were facing a lot of hate and you know, some support, some hate. So, I mean, half of them decided to come back. But sometimes they didn't have any place to go. Like that region is like, they have destroyed houses. That's a problem too. They have to have a job in order to rent something, right? But it's, it's really hard to find really a, any kind of job. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> You're saying that it's uh, Ukraine 
after the dissolution of the USSR yeah. was in positive, extraordinary performance. Yeah. Can you tell us why that would have happened? And then the second question, you read about Crimea. Yeah. Well, Crimea has had a very tumultuous history mm -hmm. over the last hundreds of years. Oh, yeah. Is it really Ukrainian? Because the Cossacks were there and they were expelled and then it happened multiple. Mm -hmm. So can you give us some of the history? Right, that's going to take two hours now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me answer your second question first, and then we will say it again the first one. Okay, because okay, the whole thing about Crimea, I'm not really good on dates, but probably in 1956, of that time, uh, Khrushchev decided uh, to connect Crimea to Ukraine. Why? Because at the time, Crimea was a very poor region. They didn't have water channel. They didn't, so only few people live there. You know, and they were encouraging Soviet Union people to go to Crimea and all kind of, they went, uh, why? Because they took out all Tatarian people, you know, uh, native uh, nation of Crimea, they took all of them from their houses and sent them to Siberia by trains. So basically what happened, another Russian train, you know, took these Tatarian people away, and another train were bringing Russians promised good life there. <coughs> As a matter of fact, they were getting in the houses of these people. I mean, I, it's almost like in their warm bed. You know, just, you know, got to the house, it's already, you know, furnished and have everything in it, just okay, I'll come in here, right? Because it was uh, bad people, and they were sent to Siberia, right? But what they faced was a low level of provision. Because of lack of water, they cannot have any agricultural stuff there. So that's why Khrushchev connected to Ukraine and uh, took away from Ukraine part on the, on the, uh, on the top which used to be a Ukrainian part, equal to the size of Crimea. Did you know that? They took away some part, so Ukraine would have the same territory in a few millimeters, right? So after they took it, it's not like took it back, like it, it was not a gift. We had to give, give away some territories, we gained some territories. And of course, that's like uh, for Americans, like a Florida. Yeah. You know, Crimea is quite a sweet place because they have all these uh, summer you know, vacations there and it's beautiful in winter. They have beautiful mountains there. I really love that, that place. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I've been there a couple of times. It's, it's a tremendous experience. But the Russians used to have their military base. That was a problem since Soviet Union fell apart. They were actually, I know they have this kind of a script how to get back Crimea, you know. They were waiting for perfect time. What was in 2000, 2014, that was perfect time. And they just did it. So of course, and uh, it was not Russian land uh, since ancient times. I think it was Russian probably last 300 years. Before it was Turkey, and before, you know, who knows what it was. <laughs> no, not Roman Empire, I hope, but why not? And if, what, your first question, what was it? The poverty in, uh, oh, in sure. 1990. Mm. Because all chain, chains of, pro, uh, of um, production were broken. You know, uh, suddenly Ukraine didn't have that um, amount of money on bank accounts because all gold of a uh, communist party happened to be in Moscow. Right, and actually it disappeared. I still don't know what happened to that gold. Right? <laughs> that person who was responsible for that, suddenly he found him dead, right? And, right, so we, we were you know, keeping all our gold in Moscow. That was a weird thing. <laughs> if I may, yeah. I mean, um, Ukraine, the Ukraine. No, that's okay. No, I'm trying to make a point. Okay, yeah. The Ukraine was seen for so many years as a territory of Russia. No. Uh, my father was born in St. Petersburg in 1905 and they right. fled in 17. Right. 
Yeah. And I was always brought up, I mean, bad family history, that my grandmother, who was Ukrainian, her yeah. name was Tatiana Kohanenko, okay. was Russian. Okay. And it's only when I went to their graves when I was a child and right. said it's spelled wrong, and they said, no, it's actually spelled in Ukrainian. Right. That they had to start to explain. Yeah. But that understanding of, uh, on the part of many Russians, mm -hmm. that the Ukraine mm -hmm. was a part of Russia, mm -hmm. it seems to me is one of the reasons why Putin can get away with a lot of what he's doing. Because embedded in many old Russians thinking is that Ukraine is not anything but the breadbasket for Russia. Well, the Russia itself is a, a kind of a bread production a lot, right? They're selling it a lot to the United States. But um, um, I understand your question, but you have to realize this, is, this war is number 23rd for independency from Russia. Mm -hmm. Of the Ukrainian nation, 23rd. It was uh, probably the last 400 years. They were kind of were used as a parasite, or you know, par being a parasite on the body of Ukraine. In 1917, when the oldest uh, Russian Revolution happened, when they occupied Ukraine, there was little power actually, and they were independent until the end of the second. World War. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. But uh, they were independent for quite a long time. But the Russians came and they, of course, they, didn't, they, they took away their independence. And what they, what they were doing, you know, this uh, 1933, that uh, big um, death because of lack of, of, of bread, right? Yeah. What they cause it, yeah. cause it just taking away whatever, all the food from your, from the fridge or from your storages. And people were dying. There was Ukrainian, uh -huh. you know, who was dying. They were keep killing Ukrainians, you know, like who would have the nationality in their genes, right? So I know the terrible story when they, in 1920 something, they uh, decided to gather, you know, this traveling musicians with, uh, right now it's guitar, but it used to be a different kind of a string instrument. They decided to gather them, like, okay, we can create a union. And everybody was so excited, wow, they're gonna, you know, promote us or something. They killed them. I mean, they gathered them in our, our art center and then took them outside of the city, or everybody, and just killed them all. Yeah. Because they were the one who would say truth in songs, you know, about everything that was been happening that was a threat to them. Yeah. They would keep doing it, killing everybody who thinks they are really Ukrainian. Right? Yeah. Right? Sorry. <coughs> small one is um, from up until this war started, most of us thought they would fly us to Kiev because of the chicken that we've been eating. <laughs> chicken to death. And then they, we've been told for the last year that it's actually Kiev. Yeah. But I've been hearing you say Kiev, and yeah. so um, perhaps you could enlighten us on yeah. what people keep saying. The more important question <laughs> is to try to understand our enemy, our enemy in this case is Putin. We can't win the hearts and souls of people by bombing the daylights out of them, as right. most people say. Uh, he may be able to conquer some of the real estate, but are there any circumstances which he could have the people of Ukraine ever be subservient to someone who has been just brutal to them? I think they will never ever, they really want like to die or not to be part of the Russia because they know what it looks like. Because what's gonna happen, all these patriots, they, they're gonna be killed. They will be thrown to jails. There will be thousands of, hundreds of thousands of people in jails. Or basically, they will be gonna be killed. They actually were building this list of the people who would have to be terminated, right? As soon as they uh, occupied the land. Can you imagine? Because they knew there was a volunteer working on uh, on the east, and there will be a patriots for, until their very last breath, right? So they were planning just to kill them silently, you know, you know arrest them, then just people will disappear, right? I think uh, that's why Ukrainians still fights, because they fight for their freedom. 
That's all. We're not going to be under Russia anymore. This generation is tired of being slaves of Russia. Mm-hmm. And the United States has been, been a good example. Yeah, mm-hmm. They've been awful stuff. And a lot of that was with Russia. Okay, sorry. I think you answered one question. So I was saying it like in, in the Russian version. So the, in Ukrainian, that's Kiev. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Next. Uh, how are your boys doing? Have they adjusted? And is your mother in law still in Ukraine? And is there any issue with uh, communicating with your family that's still there? Well, it was such a blessing to be able to Skype. Uh, I mean, Skype I mean, like the Viber or Telegram. It's so easy, right? Because we have an internet, they have internet. It's so good. It's like being around, still, still with us being in Kiev, with them being, uh, living in you know, Kiev. <coughs> yes, my mother, or she's still there. She, uh, she, actually, my wife, she has a number of four sisters, and they have two children each. And they were not able to, we were not able to live in Russia. So they're staying there. So she's going to stay there. Um, and my boys, they're adjusting pretty well. It's all, almost, it was one year, almost seven year. And uh, they speak English, both speak English. Um, the, uh, the seven years old one, he is doing the best because he went for kindergarten. And uh, for him, everything was so natural. I mean, he, he was saying, and when I got, actually, as a matter of fact, I got this you know, report, I was crying because I was good. But I was, I was, on every subject, I was singing like a little. Progression every every month it was a progression progression. I cannot say the same thing, thing with my oldest son because he ended up to be in the third grade. And um, sometimes when he was bringing home his homework, I was like, okay, I really don't know how to help you here because it's so complicated. So we had help of some of our American friends to do that. You also have your mom, Sorry. right? Excuse me? Mom. Oh, my mom, she's still in Ukraine, yes. Yeah, and they, yeah. they talk to each other a lot. I've been there when she's on the phone and she's calling the phone. Sure. One, one last question, Brian. Thank you. An easy one for you here. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. What's going to happen? <laughs> what would your mother in law say is going to happen? <laughs> Good point. I have to ask her. <laughs> I don't know. And you have to have to have some idea of the situation. Okay, I don't have any any, any reason for this, but what I feel it might take up to three years. I don't know. It's just my feeling, because I cannot see any end of it. Because they keep coming, the Russian keep willing to die for no for no cause. Like what is what is it? Because for twenty years they they've been feed been defend right. With a poison propaganda, like building American America as a, as an enemy, or a, if something wrong happened, you know, we have, we have a joke about it that it's like it's, well, that's all, someone being in the elevator that was American. <laughs> uh, it's something that's poison propaganda. If something bad happened in Russia, that was American. No, that was no, not me. No, it was not this the right? What a blunder. Thank, Thank you. you. Brother. Thank you. Thank you. Is our gift to you and a piece of art from one of our members' charities. Thank in you. Africa. This is so cool. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, and we're thinking about you yeah. and all the Ukrainians Thank you so much. in this continuous battle for freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please, board members, we're going to meet very briefly. Shouldn't take but a few minutes. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. We've got a meeting next week, and we have the induction. People signed up for the show.